Spirit um, has been a spiritual ecology center that has been offering, I'm just gonna okay that, uh, advocacy and programming centered on water as the creator and sustainer of all life for over 20 years. I was hired back in 2020 following the brutal murder of George Floyd to fully express Water Spirit's mission of hearing the cries of the earth and the cries of the poor and strengthening advocacy around the interconnectedness of all social justice issues. Personally, I grew up in Teaneck in Bergen County, and I'm a lifetime alumnus of Rutgers University where I studied economics undergrad. And in 2020, I became a Rutgers University certified green infrastructure champion. Seeing the same problems happening throughout the state, we hope you'll make the most of tonight's program with active hope. Next slide, please. We will be sharing all resources that we share tonight, all, all the rich exchange that we're going to have after this evening. So we invite you to be fully present as we dive into this vital pressing topic of dire concern in this region. This has been a while we've been able to do Zoom. These are some reminders. We will be recording and live streaming this on Facebook. And so just a reminder to keep yourself muted, uh, keep to this etiquette so that we can focus on the speakers and then of course the very rich question and answer session. Next slide, please. Okay, so Water Spirit begins every meeting with a land acknowledgement. Let us acknowledge that we are all on stolen land wherever we are tuning in from tonight. Please feel free to find and share your location, which I will share in the chat, uh, using this great tool called nativeland.ca. And you should be able to see that here. Be active in the chat box. <laughs> we welcome it. Um, and again, this is going to be the beginning of, of all, a few different focuses on this broader topic. Water Spirit is headquartered on occupied Leni Lenape land on the peninsula they named Naram Sunk. We offer gratitude for the Lenape people's past, present, and future here in Lenape Hoking and throughout the diaspora. We commit ourselves to writing unjust systems and writing our relationships with these lands waters, and people. And next slide, please. I want to thank first our partners, the historic Southern Burlington County, New Jersey branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, New Jersey League of Conservation Voters and their staff leads on this endeavor, Molly Riley and Isabel Molina, and all of our stellar co-sponsors who got the word out about this event. Thank you to co-sponsors Camden Community Partnership, Latino Action Network, Atlantic Climate Justice Alliance, Newark Dig, Sewage Free Streets and Rivers, Highlands Preservation Alliance, Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, Wind of the Spirit, Raritan Headwaters, New Jersey Sustainable Business Council, Tri-County Sustainability, New Jersey Highlands Coalition, Latinx in Sustainability, Coalition for Delaware River Watershed, Resilient Northeastern New Jersey, New Jersey Future, and Sustainable Jersey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Next slide, please. We want to take a moment to offer a big thank you also to the funders of this webinar series, the Watershed Institute. The Watershed Institute's mission is to keep water clean, safe, and healthy. They work to protect and restore water and the natural environment in New Jersey through conservation advocacy, science, and education. Thank you again for making this series a priority. We are doing all of this tonight with your support. Next slide, please. Welcome to the first of a series of four webinars focusing on environmental justice and stormwater management. This is a preview of tonight's speakers and I'm going to read the more extensive bios now. Andy Cricken, we're gonna start with, is a professional engineer with a degree from Princeton University and has 35 years of experience in wastewater and biosolids management. Over the course of 23 years, he served as both deputy director and then executive director of the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority. He is currently a managing director with Moonshot Missions and also a senior fellow with the US Water Alliance. He also serves on the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, New Jersey Environmental Justice Advisory Council, the board of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, and the steering committee for Jersey Water Works. 
Okay, Ben Siracco is the Research and Digital Services Faculty Librarian, working at a South Jersey-based medical school. In this role, he is responsible for providing instruction and assistance to students, staff, and faculty on topics related to scholarly publishing, research data management, and evidence-based medicine. He lives and works in the city of Camden, where he serves on the Shade Tree Advisory Board and advocates for environmental issues in the city. He has completed research and community grant work focusing on environmental health literacy in Camden. He has worked in previous library roles at the state, the New Jersey State Library, the Atlantic City Free Public Library and History Museum, and at Mertz Library of the New York Botanical Garden. He holds a Master of Library Science from Queens University in New York City and a Master of the Arts in Instructional Technology from Stockton University in Southern New Jersey, for those of you who don't know. And I met our first speaker, Marcus Sibley, during a public comment period at the onset of COVID-19, as we spoke back to back sharing the importance of Black maternal health in the face of preventable pollution. Marcus Sibley is an environmental and social justice activist, speaker, and poet with a deep and profound commitment to justice and progress. He serves as the NAACP NJ Environmental and Climate Justice Chairman, the President of the Southern Burlington County NAACP Branch, and the Chairman of the New Jersey Progressive Equitable Energy Coalition, NJPEEC. A consummate proponent of education outreach, the multiple award winner for environmental advocacy and social justice, most recently the 2022 NJLCB Changemaker Award has been featured for his work on radio and television and news publications such as ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, AP News, New York Post, Atlanta Black Star, and CNN.com, to name a few. The Rutgers University alum with undergraduate and graduate degrees in social work is also the National Wildlife Federation Director of conservation partnerships for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Mr. Sibley is grateful for his purpose, his loved ones, and every opportunity to share information because education truly is power. Take it away, Marcus. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Rachel, for the uh, wonderful introduction. And again, it's, it's amazing that we met on that that uh, call so long ago, and we've got so much done in a short amount of time. So first of all, thank you to everyone who, who is tuning in tonight for this very important topic. Um, thank you to Water Spirit and uh, NJLCV for spearheading these efforts and all the co-sponsors. Um, I wanna dive right into it. Um, why this is important tonight. Uh, you know, we, we speak about flooding, we speak about combined sewer overflows often. But tonight we're speaking about why is a social justice and a public health crisis? Um, that's, a different, that's a different piece of the puzzle. So uh, I'm, I'm excited that we're able to speak about this because unfortunately, despite all the history, despite all the reality, people still like to believe that racism doesn't play a role in everything and, and white supremacy doesn't play a role in everything. So we're gonna get into that. Um, and, but before we get into that, I also wanna point out something else that's very important. The makeup of our speakers tonight. We have, uh, we have Ben and we have Andy. And often when we have these conversations about what's happening in, in overburned communities, we usually only have black and brown representatives. That we also have uh, white brothers and sisters in these conversations because Camden has white residents. Camden had AAPI residents. Uh, Perthamboy has white. AAPI, all residents, Patterson, Nord, we, we, there may be disproportionate impacts and these may be predominantly black and brown communities, but it impacts all the residents and the residents are everyone. And I wanna focus on that because, because this world is still really racist. If we don't point out that these things are impacting everyone else, then people will close their ears and close their eyes and pretend like it's not happening which is what happens all the time in environmental justice communities. So that's why it's really, really important for us to make sure that we're speaking about 
all the people who are impacted by things like storming and 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 uh, uh, flooding and stormwater damage. Um, but first, let, let's 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 get to the definition of of why we're here: environmental justice. Um, as you can see on the slide, um, environmental uh, environmental justice folks and representation. So we have impacted communities are uh, represented in the decision decision making process. So everything that's said. It's being said because that hasn't been happening. So when we say impacted communities are represented in the decision-making process, for so long, our communities, black and brown communities and poor communities, the decisions have been made about us without us. So environmental justice is saying we need to get those voices to the table at the decision-making tables so they can have direct input on what's happening to, in their communities. The process, planning processes and decision-making are fair, transparent, accessible, and provide opportunities for impacted communities to participate. Again, this has not been happening. This is what we're fighting for. Uh, and then distribution, environmental benefits and impacts are distributed equitably uh, and or mitigated so that no one community bears a disproportionate burden, the burden piece. So we're saying we're fighting to make sure that certain communities don't bear the disproportionate burden because historically black and brown communities have bore the disproportionate burden of environmental hazards. So therefore we, we are the recipients of anything that is happening negative when it comes to the environment, all the storm water runoffs, the flooding, all these things that we'll talk about further. And I'm so happy that we have Ben and, and, and Andy on this call to further expound on that, but because of racism, all the things have happened in these communities. And now we're saying we need to change that. Now, according to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. This goal will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have healthy environment in which they live, learn, and work. So again, the exact same thing that has been displayed here on the slide, it is trying to level the playing field because for so long, the playing field has not been fair. And why? Why hasn't it been fair? Well not only has the, the country been racist and, 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 and white supremacy has led to policies, but it wasn't just feelings. There were practices. There were covert, I mean, there were overt that became covert, but there were overt practices that restricted black and first black and then brown people and poor from opportunities. So we know one of the best ways to earn and generate, generate wealth is by home ownership. Well, in this country, we had many, many, many issues that were from the government as well as within our communities that impacted home ownership. So one of those things that we had that impacted that is 100% tied to the conversation today is we had redlining. We had redlining where that kept certain people in certain areas and that had profound impact. So when we often speak about redlining, we talk about the practices of real estate agents of only showing properties in a certain area. Um, or we speak about when the, the residents of a community uh, actively participate in barring people, Black people, from moving into those areas. That's what we traditionally talk about. But the actual definition of redlining comes from the process, the process, what is it now, 90 years ago, when the government maps outlined areas where Black residents lived, and then they therefore deem those areas risky investments. So why did that matter? Because the investment piece tied into the mortgage piece, because the government then started um, handing out government-backed mortgages, opportunities, home ownership programs. So you had people having an opportunity to uh, um, build wealth with the assistance of the government, 
But people who lived in these areas didn't have that opportunity. So what do you have? You have certain people who are designated to a certain area, other people moving away from that area because now they have a government assistance. They can go move into the suburbs. So now when they move, that means all the benefits of their jobs, their taxes, their involvement in the community, that moves. So now that area now becomes designated as a risky area. There's no economic development. There's no care for that area. So there's no, at the, at the very minimum, <laughs> there's no stormwater management. So when we're speaking about the environmental justice concerns of what storm water is, you have runoff and you have sewage and you have uh, uh, all these different materials that are coming out of our sewers that are coming from waste facilities that are all coming into one pipe. And let me give you the EPA definition really quickly. Uh, CSOs or combined sewer system um, overflows um, where a combined sewer system collects rainwater runoff, domestic sewage, and industrial wastewater into one pipe. Under normal conditions, it transport all of the wastewater it collects to a sewage treatment plant for treatment, then discharges to a water body. The volume of what wastewater can sometimes exceed the capacity of the combined sewer system or treatment plant, i.e. during heavy rainfalls, events of snow melt, when it occurs, untreated storm water and, and wastewater discharges directly to nearby streams, river, other water bodies, and into neighborhoods, as I'm sure Ben can speak to. So this is a major issue. It's a major environmental justice issue because the storm water, this is untreated sewage. So you know that's not healthy for the environment. That's not healthy, healthy for the soil. That's not healthy no aspects of it is beneficial. So you have people living in certain communities that aren't worrying about this. You have people living in one community that have been redlined and, and many other practices and they have to deal with this every day. But why is that a, a, a bigger problem? So the bigger problem that happened when there, when there was redlining and when there's opportunities for certain groups to move out and gain wealth, that led to the racial wealth gap that we have here in New Jersey. And, and, and we know money, where there's money, there's power. So when you have a racial wealth gap, that means you have a whole community that doesn't have the power to be able to demand change in their community. So this is why we're all fighting for environmental justice because these communities didn't have any power. So according to the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, right here in New Jersey, the median net worth of New Jersey's white families is 200 $71,402, the highest in the nation. But the median net worth for New Jersey's Latino and Black families is just $7,020 and $5,900 respectively. So you have over a $200,000 gap, dollar gap in the wealth and you wonder why things aren't changing. You wonder why we consider this a crisis. So acknowledging the reality is the first step. The first step is there have been practices that have put certain people, traditionally black and brown, and our poor in certain neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods deal with excessive amounts of waste because of racism, the, the way things way things are zoned, our polluting factories are always zoned near where these people live. So you have your incinerators, you have your scrap uh, um, um, facilities, you have all these different facilities that are contributing to the pollution, close proximity to these communities, and they can't do anything about it because they don't have the power because there's a racial wealth gap. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to show you the connections between the environmental problems, racism, and economics. And until, until we start having these very real conversations, nothing's going to change. This is why we all need to be in this conversation. We all need to be speaking about why this is wrong. And we can't fix the, race, the racial wealth gap overnight, but we can fight for things that impact it. We can fight for people to have jobs. We can fight for job training in these communities. We can fight for student debt forgiveness because we know because of the racial wealth gap, the, the majority of people who have student significant student loan debt are black people. We can fight to have that reduced. So there's a lot that we can do. I know sometimes it can seem overwhelming, 
But if we can continue to band together, if our, all of our brothers and sisters can understand that it is a human right to be able to live in a community where you don't have sewage on your streets anytime there is a storm. It is a human right to have clean water because this also impacts drinking water as well. So these are all human rights. I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak for a few minutes about this topic. And on that note, I'm going to pass the microphone to my good brother, Ben Sirocco, who will speak further on the subject. Thank you so much, Marcus, for that great uh, beginning to this presentation. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about right off the bat are some of the health impacts from flooding in these combined sewer systems. So according to the NJDEP, nearly 95% of New Jersey's waterways do not meet federal water quality standards. A lot of ground is being made on that, uh, particularly around Philadelphia and Camden, where there's been big strides to try and clean up the water quality, to try and actually use certain parts of the bodies of water there rec recreationally, using kayaking, building, uh, you know, really devoting time to really try and reintroduce sturgeon and, and really clean up uh, those waterways, which is great, but we're not there yet. Um, so direct exposure to sewage can have some serious health implications, you know, cholera, typhoid, hepatitis, polio, you know, swimming in this contaminated water can cause other types of illnesses, skin rashes, GI problems, even miscarriages, sadly. Uh, the picture I have on the right is an example, and it's not, sadly, it's not unique. There's a lot of areas that have, you know, pretty high density housing in this city, and particularly, you know, in, in, in poorer and black or brown neighborhoods where the, the flooding is a serious problem. This is at the Crestberry apartment complex uh, right next actually to the uh, Covanta incinerator. You can see there's a playground right there. And naturally, if a kid's going out to play on a playground, sees that body of water, I mean, who doesn't want to splash around, you know, but it's, 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 it's a big problem in cities like Canada that have combined sewer systems. Um, there's a couple other pictures there from that, from, uh, from that location. The next one is, um, shows that this actually, this happens frequently. And I should credit these pictures. These are actually from an activist in Camden named Amir Khan, who's done a lot of work to try and um, clean up these locations. And by, by clean up, I mean actually have some of these property owners, which are private, you know, actually invest into the, into the facilities. Um, you know, one thing you might not think about with water and flooding, it can actually cause indoor air impacts. You know, when this keeps happening at these facilities that are not being invested in by these, these private interests, um, mold develops. And the last picture I have here just shows you an example of inside one of these apartments is actually from one of those apartments. So, you know, all this mold growing there can lead to asthma, um, especially for younger age groups. In Camden, um, children are 150% higher, have a higher likelihood of going to the emergency room for asthma than the average in New Jersey. Um, and there's even, you know, just like what I call psychosocial impacts, you know, if there's all this flooding going on in your neighborhood, are you going to use that playground? Are you going to go to a medical appointment? Are you going to have a call out from school? You know, number one reason for call outs of schools for sick for children is asthma. Um, as you can see, it just, just builds on top of each other. You know, this, this can, there's academic research that shows that this can exacerbate existing mental health problems. Um, so it all sort of builds on top of each other, sadly. You can go to the next slide, please. So Camden is one of the hardest hit areas in New Jersey from uh, combined sewer systems. Uh, I took this video actually on Monday night next to a property in my neighborhood. Um, this big downpour was happening and this property that I, um, that I own, I was worried about a leak coming in. So I went behind the property and this is actually an apartment building right on the right. That's a window to someone's apartment where that water is actually exploding out of a sewer. And I looked at it and it wasn't just pure water. There was, you know, there was an odor, there was, you know, particulates in it, whatever you want to call it, it was not good. And this was just the beginning of this high storm. It had only been going on really heavily for 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, it's a hundred year old combined sewer system. Um, and in Camden, like many places, when these uh, get overloaded, these sewer systems, they actually try to they actually empty out into the Delaware River. And if it's high tide, these pipes are underwater and the water has no place to go. Um, also, you know, Delaware River is a pretty silty, you know, mucky river. Um, honestly, it's not like a beautiful Caribbean uh, ocean. Uh, so these things get filled up with, with muck and have to be cleaned out. Um, and if you can go to the next picture in this slide. So the red circles you see are actually surface level parking lots on the, on the, on the uh, sort of on the waterway of Camden along the Delaware River. You can imagine when water, heavy rain like that happens, the water has no place to go. This is not, this is, 
impervious surface. It goes directly into that sewer system. You know, Camden was a big industrial hub, and a lot of these were sites at factories for Campbell's Soup and for RCA Victor. But sadly, some of these are actually newer parking lots that some of these companies have put in and not chosen to necessarily, in my opinion, to do the best design to actually stop that from happening to that apartment building we saw in the first picture. I can go to the next slide. Oh, I have one more image. And I sadly, I actually took this tonight, right before signing on to this meeting. My local library now, right a couple blocks from uh, where these pictures are taken, is actually closed due, due to flooding. So you can see, you know, it really affects people in many different ways that you might not think of. You can go to the next slide. So what are some hurdles to addressing this problem? This map you see on the right is actually where FEMA flood zones are in the city of Camden. And you can see where those flood zones are, are actually where a lot of those parking lots are. So it's, it's a terrible combination to have impervious parking lots, surface level parking lots and flood zones. Um, there's a big lack of, of quality, um, safe housing in Camden. It sort of goes back to what Marcus was saying about redlining. A lot of these neighborhoods, you know, people couldn't buy their own homes, so they had to move out. And you have investors come in that really don't always have the best interests of residents in mind and don't really create safe housing for these residents. Um, so a lot of Camden residents, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about Camden residents. I'm, I'm, I am not your typical Camden resident in, in, in many ways. And I don't want to make it seem like I'm speaking for all Camden residents. I just want to say that. Um, but, you know, over 50% of Camden residents are renters. Um, and those that do own homes, if you have a home in one of these flood zones, you have to pay flood insurance, which is another cost on top of everything you have to pay. Um, you know, Camden is making strides to create that stormwater utility in, in response to the Clean Stormwater and Flood Reduction Act. Um, and I think they have done a feasibility study in 2021, but they should really be the first community in, in, in the state to get that done. And I, I just hope that, you know, that, that, that gets done as soon as possible. And just the last thing I'll say is, you know, some of these large developments that are taking place that they really need to be held to as high a standard as possible um, for how they manage their sewer and water. Um, I'm not trying to call out Subaru uh, specifically, but I do have them mention that they are a green company that does a lot of good. But I believe when they first were going in, there, there were some hurdles about them maybe separating out their sewage and maybe not doing the greenest, uh, the greenest thing possible. And if you go to the next image I have on this slide, you know, talking about low quality housing in Camden, one of the largest um, privately owned housing units is called Northgate. Um, they were just hit with over 1,100 housing uh, uh, code violations. And a lot of those were to do with mold and, and water related issues. I mean, this is a huge amount of fines to get. Um, just shows you an example of some of the challenges that uh, Camden residents have to, to have to face. And the last thing I'll show, the last image here, this is just showing you how many rental units there are in Camden. It's over 50% 50, 50 or over 55%. So it's just a huge amount of renters and they don't really have the income to install a French drain or have a, some expensive company come in and do waterproofing um, or, or really address the plumbing. And you have a lot of landlords that aren't doing that type of work. So I just wanted to show that. Can go to the next slide, please. So what I think are some of the residents' priorities and concerns, you know, there's people might think that since Camden is a low income community largely, um, uh, is that, you know, that it must be cheap to live there. And that's not actually true. This um, data on the right actually shows you just how difficult it is, how unaffordable it is for someone to find a three bedroom apartment in Camden. If you were to zoom out on that map, which I can't do right now, you'd see it's, it's actually more expensive than, than some neighboring whiter, richer communities that you wouldn't think of. Um, so over 33% live in poverty, but even though they, there's people that are living in poverty, they're still paying a huge amount of their proportion of their income in rent. Um, so there is, you know, so I say quality of life there. Um, so there is, has been a great investment in public parks in the city, but they have to be accessible. If they're getting flooded frequently, like the Wiggins Park does, the Delaware River overflows into it and puts debris onto the walkway, it's not really that helpful if your park is, is being flooded frequently. Um, I say equity between corporations and residents, you know, creating more stringent water and sewer management standards for major developments. Um, and again, creating that stormwater utility as soon as possible. And one thing about these stormwater utilities is once they're built, the way that they can be funded can be a combination of commercial or residential property, I believe. I believe Andy knows much more about this than me. Um, but I'm hoping for in Camden that that is either totally from commercial properties or you know, 90% or higher so that 
this you know burden that's being placed on residents is really kind of uh, equitably um, funded in the city. And then again, another thing, a priority or a concern, Camden has a vacant environmental commission that should really be activated. Um, and I'm not really trying to beat up Camden city government. They have a lot on their plate and uh, a lot going on. This article was just published in the Philadelphia Inquirer a few days ago. I asked the uh, presenters or, or the organizers of this presentation, oh, did you, were you speaking to these reporters? Because it touches on so much of what we're presenting on and talking about and so many of the challenges that are, that are going on in the city. So if you have time, you might want to just Google that title and read that article and it just talks about, you know, how this is a, a financial burden, having to deal with this flooding and these issues. You can go on to the next slide. Oh, and just one other thing I'll say quickly, there's still a, a distrust, if you hit it back really quick, there's still just a, a distrust of water in the city in general. Uh, this is from a few years ago, you know, Camden after 17 years still gives out bottled water. In all, in all of their public schools. And last time I checked on this, it's still, they're trying to encourage that it's safe to drink, but still most of the public schools are still using bottled water. So it's a big concern, I think, about trust of water in the city in general. All right, so thanks so much. I think that's it for me. And I'll turn it over to Andy Cricken, who uh, you know is very well known and respected in the city and has done so much in the area of uh, water infrastructure and environmental justice. So thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ben. It's, it's first of all, uh, it's, it's an honor to be on the same panel with uh, Marcus and Ben, two of my uh, colleagues and friends who I admire very much. So uh, thanks for being, for your great presentations. And thanks very much to NJ uh, LCV and Water Spirit and NAACP for co-sponsoring this and also for sponsoring uh, the co-sponsors, the other co-sponsors that sponsored this program um, and for everyone who's tuned in as well. Um, and so uh, basically I, um, it were as a, Isabel had said, I'd, or, I'm sorry, Rachel had said, I, I worked um, in Camden for many years at the Camden County MUA in Waterfront South. And, you know, uh, following up on what uh, Marcus was saying about environmental justice. And, and I mean, to me, the, the community that I used to work in, Waterfront South, is like the poster child of environmental injustice and just disproportionate environmental burden. And just to, go, to underscore that, Camden County has a population of over 500,000 people. The Waterfront South community is a community of about 2,000. So all the sewage from every single person in Camden County, except for people in septic, goes to this the wastewater treatment plant where I used to work in Waterfront South. And the trash plant, or most of the trash from, the, from Camden County is also located in that same square mile that's Waterfront South, in the neighborhood of Waterfront South. In addition to having the sewage, the county sewage plant and the, the majority of the county trash going to this one neighborhood, there were also, when I left two years ago, there were 28 uh, known brownfield sites, two super, former Superfund sites that have been remediated, all within the same you know, one square mile, and then also several industries as well. And yet the people that live there, that is the, have to live with that. And that is, that is the example of disproportionate burden with respect to flooding, with respect to air emissions, and with respect to brownfields and contamination. With regard to, and, and I guess what, what, what prompted me to get involved with this while I worked at the CSEMUA was seeing children walking through puddles of sewage, like this, the picture that Ben showed, knowing that they didn't know that first that it was puddles of, of sewage. In a combined sewer community, whether it be Camden or, or any of the other 20 CSO communities in New Jersey, if it's raining and there's flooding, unless the unless it's flooding, you know, a puddle that hasn't gone in into the into the system yet, it is raw sewage. And to give you an idea. In Camden, on a dry weather day, the flow is about 10 million gallons a day from people just flushing their toilets, showers, et cetera, you know, commercial. On a typical wet weather day, not, not a drizzle, but not a not a hurricane either, like a you know, a heavy rain day, that 10 million gallons a day goes up to 100, 10 times the size. So what you're talking about is the, the sewer pipes um, that, that Marcus showed in his drawing are just undersized. They can't they can't, uh, you know, handle it because they're designed for maybe, you know, they were built before the advent of the automobile, before everything was paved over, as Ben was showing all that impervious surface. So as a result, you know, 10 million gallons a day are coming from, from, from you know, normal sewage, you know, showers, rain, et cetera, uh, uh, not, not rain, sh sh showers, rain, uh, you know, the toilet, et cetera. 90 million gallons a day are coming from impervious surface. Just to give you an, an, an idea, when I talk about more about stormwater utilities, I'll describe you know, what that means from a percentage standpoint and what that means from equity. 
So basically the 21 CSO communities in New Jersey, including Camden City, uh, and most of them, most of the CSO communities are environmental justice communities as well, like Perth Amboy, Patterson, Newark, Trenton, Camden, et cetera. Um, so they have these combined sewer systems. The state did mandate doing something about it. And when I worked at the CSMUA, we were actually proactively doing it even before 2019. And there were a number of things that we did do, um, such as putting in green infrastructure. And there's a picture of the Phoenix Park that the CSMUA put in. To, the idea is, is to, if, if the reason that the combined sewers are a problem is because of so much impervious surface, then if you depave the city, if you put as much green space as possible, you're soaking up the stormwater and, and reversing the problem. We also expanded Camden City sewer system so it could convey more flow to the sewage treatment plant, which is also shown in the picture. And we also made the sewage treatment plant bigger so it could receive more flow. Because basically, as Marcus was describing, there's only three places that combined sewage can go. When you when you add rainwater to sewage, you're you know, if you add a gallon of rainwater to a gallon of sewage, you have two gallons of sewage because they 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 mix. And if you get add, as I said, it's nine to one. If you, if you add nine gallons of, of rainwater to a gallon of sewage, you now have 10 gallons of sewage. Um, and there's only three places it can go. Hopefully it goes to the sewage treatment plant, which is why we made the sewer pipes bigger and the sewage treatment plant bigger to receive more flow. But if it doesn't go there, then it's either in people's basements or in their streets or in their parks or into the river, and which is a complete injustice. So the, the state is requiring the 21 CSO communities to um, deal with these combined sewer problems. But the, the key is to make sure that everyone has, you know, doesn't have sewage in their basements, has clean waterways, but also at an affordable rate. And, and these, the, these systems are very expensive to construct. So Camden's combined sewer plan is something on the order of $100 million to, to implement. I know Perth Amways is something like $280 million. Now the state does provide, um, in, in the New, New Jersey Infrastructure Bank does provide funding um, to help reduce that cost, but it's still a very expensive burden that has to be borne. And the more stormwater there is, the more the more cost there is to, to, to convey and treat it. Next slide, please. So the notion of a stormwater utility is to try to achieve an equity, to try to encourage um, you know, owners of impervious surface to, to, to deal with the, the, the stormwater on site, either by, you know, putting in green infrastructure that will soak up the stormwater or directing it to a separate stormwater pipe, which is what we tried to do with Subaru, for example, which Ben was referring to, but unsuccessfully. Now, Philadelphia across the river has a stormwater fee, a stormwater utility, where they charge for impervious surface. And as a result, a significant number of, of industries contribute to green infrastructure because it's in their economic interest to do so. However, in Camden, we were unable to do, uh, do any of that because there is, there is no economic incentive. And up until two or three years ago, it was not legal to have a stormwater fee or a stormwater utility, but the legislature did pass uh, a le the Clean, Clean Stormwater and Flood Reduction Act, which now makes it permissive, not mandatory, but at least allows communities to charge a stormwater fee. Now let me explain why that is so equitable to do so. Because as I said, the flow from Camden City on a dry weather day is 10 million gallons a day. And what I'm saying is, is, is illustrative of Camden, but it's true of any CSO community, uh, all 21 CSO communities or anywhere in the country. So in Camden, 10 million gallons a day on a dry weather day, on a wet weather day, a typical wet weather day, it's 100 million gallons a day. Now it doesn't rain every single day, but it, I did a calculation while I was in Camden. And basically what I calculated is if you took 100 million gallons a day on wet weather days and 10 million gallon days, 10 million gallons a day on a dry weather day, and then average it over in a, a typical year, you've got about 40% of the flow that goes to the wastewater treatment plant is from impervious surface. It's from wet, wet uh, is on, you know, because it's 10 times as much. So, but basically if no one is paying for that, then everyone is paying for it. Uh, next slide, please. So Mr. Jones and Mrs. Mrs. Smith is, is paying for the stormwater generated by all impervious surface, by the large parking lots and parking garages. And that is not just. Now this, this drawing here shows the difference between equality and equity. Well, you could say it's, it's equal that everyone pays the same sewer bill. That's the, the slide on the left where everyone has can see the game, but the person, the shorter person or the person in the wheelchair can't really see the game, even though they're they're allowed to stand by the fence. Only when we achieve, we only achieve equity, real justice, when we give everyone a chance to see over the fence. And to have people who don't own large swaths of impervious surface 
to pay, pay everyone pays the same bill when they're not generating the, the same amount of flow is completely unjust. The EPA Region 3 did a similar study for the city of Wilmington, and it was again, it was about they came out with 42%. So again, it's only two data points, but the point is, is that in basically the average resident is paying for the cost of impervious services in combined sewer communities, and that is really unjust. Now you could say that, well, what about a small homeowner? You know, they can't afford to pay for a driveway. Well, one way around that to make it even more equitable would be to say, you know what, you can't you can't say, well, only private can pay because that is discriminatory and that would never stand up legally. But you could say that the, if the average homeowner, I'll just make it up as say 500 square feet of impervious surface, so that's what it is, whatever the number is, then that make the first 500 square feet free for everybody. But then the people who own 10,000 square feet, 100,000 square feet, they're paying 99,500, 9,500, and they're paying their fair share. So everyone's getting the same benefit. It, it's, re, it's unwinding the equity, equity, the equality and equity backwards, making sure that everyone is paying for their fair share of the stormwater that they're generating. Because again, when you mix a gallon of stormwater with a gallon of sewage, you get two gallons of sewage that have to be pumped and treated the same exact way. But yet people who are generating that flow are not paying for it if the, if the community does not have a stormwater fee. And the cost of, of dealing with that treatment is being borne by the residents and it's borne disproportionately. If we can get commercial owners of imper large swaths of impervious service to pay a stormwater fee, then the fee will either go toward paying the, the capital improvements needed to deal with the extra stormwater that their impervious service is generating, or they have the option of capturing the stormwater on site and waiving the fee. So they don't have to pay because they're not discharging any, you know, discharging them, they're taking care of it on site, but then the burden to the to the municipality and its ratepayers is lowered accordingly. And that is 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 achieving an equity that is really essential in combined sewer communities. The last thing I'll say real quick, next slide, please, is that um this even in separate communities, stormwater communities, there still is a a, a charge, a cost for 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 dealing with even separate stormwater, there are inlets, culverts, et cetera. And if large owners of impervious service aren't paying toward the maintenance of those costs, even though there isn't the same uh, public health imperative, like in the case of combined sewage, there still is an equity issue, even in, in separate stormwater systems. So for that reason, I, I strongly believe, very, very strongly believe that stormwater fees are essential um, for, for to achieve equity in combined sewer communities, especially, but really in every community across the state. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Those have been excellent presentations. Um, so now we're moving into the Q&A portion. Um, and I think, you know, these presentations have really highlighted what a huge issue flooding and combined sewer, sewer overflows are in New Jersey. Um, and there's, you know, some only a few ways to address this. Um, Andy touched on some really amazing solutions. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll have some some great questions from the audience that we'll get to touch on. So feel free to continue adding your questions to the chat. Um, and I will start posing some questions to the group. All right. So the first one we have from Renee is what is the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority doing to address the water issue? Um, Andy, if you'd like to start with that. Um, sure, well, I, I was the executive director and the chief engineer for the authority for many years, um, so I can at least update up through 2020, and then I have a little bit of a sense of what they've done since. So the CCMA, now one thing I should mention is the CCMA does not own the Camden City Combined Sewer System. It owns the wastewater treatment plant that receives the flow from it. So basically the CCMA is legally allowed to help Camden, but it's not obliged to do so. But I felt as Marcus and Ben said, it is a moral imperative to, to make sure that, that children do not walk through puddles of sewage to get to their bus stops. And the, the legal nexus for the CCMA to assist was the fact that if you reduce flow from the Camden City sewer system by dealing with the stormwater, it's also less flow to the sewage treatment plant, which the CCMA does own. So we were legally allowed to, to, to assist. And what we did was, I hope you've seen in Camden that we planted a number of, of, of riverfront parks and green infrastructure throughout the city. We greened about, as of through 2020, 125 acres of green infrastructure, including the Phoenix Park, the Gateway Park, uh, the Kramer Hill Nature Preserve and, and others to soak up the stormwater, but all, all only on public land because we can't do it on private land and there's no incentive for private owners to do that. We also made the sewer lines in Camden bigger 
um, but so they can send more flow to the sewage treatment plant and not overflow. And then we made the sewage treatment plant bigger to receive the flow. And we did that without raising rates because we were able to get funding from the iBank. What needs to be done still though, is that Camden City needs to work on cleaning its sewer system out because it's like, think of a, a, a clogged artery. It can't convey the blood. If the sewers aren't cleaned as much as possible, and as Ben said, there's a lot of siltation, then the, the flow, the pipe isn't as big as it should be, or it doesn't carry as much flow as it should be because it's, the bottom is silted up. So Camden needs to be aggressive about cleaning its sewers. And uh, the other thing is that Pensacan sends a lot of stormwater to the Kramer Hill section of, of, of Camden, which then that needs to be disconnected and I know that was in the article that Ben referred to, that, that is really essential that Pensacan's flow be taken out of Camden so that it doesn't add to the, the burden of, of um, on, on the Kramer Hill neighborhood. Great, thank you so much for that response. Um, ben, Marcus, if you wanna to touch on that, feel free, um, but I'm also happy to bring up another question. Um, it looks like folks were definitely curious about um, having a better idea of how many CSO communities are in the state of New Jersey. And, and Andy, I know you touched on the fact that there are 21, 21 communities, 21 communities, yeah. Right. Um, and so I think that's really helpful for the audience to know. And, and some folks dropped resources on CSO locations. Rachel dropped some, um, as well as Hugh. Thank you for doing that. So much appreciated. Um, we have another question. Um, so. On an individual level, what are some things that an individual could do to help manage stormwater in their community? Um, and I can jump in and make a couple comments on that if possible. So thankfully Camden has a lot of great um, nonprofits, like particularly small little neighborhood based ones. Uh, we have a member of CFED on, Angel, who's a member of one. Uh, but something that's going on, like the, the rain barrel projects is great. So basically they even turn into a job training program where you can have a rain barrel installed onto your gutter system. So that if there's a big uh, pouring of rain, it captures it and stops it from going into the sewer. Um, you can use it for watering. That's something that's worked fantastic in Camden. And also the New Jersey Tree Foundation is just such a hugely active um, and important organization in the city that's I forget the exact number, but some unbelievably high number of street trees that they've planted and done plantings in parks um, and just have been doing green infrastructure for so long. Um, so that, that's another thing uh, that definitely uh, helps, I would say. So those are two things I think have worked directly in, in, in my community. Great, thank you for that, Ben. Another thing to, to think about, I just to add, I agree with everything Ben said, is to, is to lobby um, lobby for a stormwater capture. Now, the, the, hopefully the city will pass, uh, or the C, and or the CCM will pass the stormwater fee. Um, in addition, Camden City did pass a sustainability ordinance, which requires the, the planning, or allow, I should say, allows the planning board to require disproportionate burden on any new development in Camden. That was something that came out of our Camden, uh, Camden Collaborative Initiative. And uh, you know that would include that it specifically included stormwater burden. So if someone's building, uh, you know, some impervious surface near a, a, a homeowner, they can ask the planning board to make sure that it's it's um, you know, contained on site. Unfortunately, as Marcus said, there's a disproportionate lack of power among the average individual, and they 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 can't go up against a, a large industry. But the, I mean that, that that ordinance is in place. But just to jump in really quickly, and I really appreciate that comment, uh, Andy, because um, when, you, when the question is, what can the people do? I mean, the, the number one thing is to be informed, um, you know, joining webinars like this where you can learn. I, Andy keeps speaking about how there's a correlation between um, uh, facilities that have uh, large amounts of impervious services and flooding. So we know that. We know where there's Anytime you know your planning board is 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 voting on something about bringing a new facility to your area, that means you can show up to that planning board meeting, and not only voice your concerns because there you have legitimate concerns here because the the data is here, but also as Andy's pointed out, there are ordinances in place that that gives you a right to to ask for certain things. So. The information part is important, but then the follow-up is the most important because often many of our groups that are, and as I look through the audience here, many of us are represented on this uh, Zoom today, 
Uh, we're out there fighting, but a lot of times when we are on these planning board meetings or council meetings or free, um, excuse me, uh, commissioner meetings, is not a lot of residential pres uh, uh, participation. You don't have a lot of residents on. So it's like the power is the numbers. So we have to continue to do our job to educate th the people about what rights they have, what roles they have, what, what can be done. But then the next and the most important piece is the people showing up and letting you know that, no, this isn't right. This isn't fair. Um, we have a voice. Our communities deserve better. We deserve clean water. We deserve clean neighborhoods. And we want more. We want better. And we vote for you. So you, you work for us. So you need to listen to us. But that has no power when it's only a couple people. And it has no power when it's only the representatives from the organizations there. You have to be able to say, my name is Joe Black from 123 Lane, and this is what I experienced. That has more weight than anything that any of us can ever say. So it's important that we continue to get educated, but then once we get that ed education, we have to share it, and we have to go out um, in, in large, strong numbers. These are some great answers, and we're getting a lot of a uh, lively conversation in the chat, which is so great to see. Um, and we won't be able to address all of these questions, but we will make sure to compile them in email and have them addressed by our wonderful speakers today. So just wanna let everybody know that um, your questions will be addressed. So we have time for one more, um, and this is by Mary. Uh, so I'm just gonna read this off. I, I wanna make sure to capture it correctly. So waterfront developers in Weehawken and other Hudson County riverfront towns build on every square inch of surface, practically at sea level, even with the history of flooding. So how does NJDEP allow for this and why can't they step in? Uh, well, I, I would say that the NJDEP, the, I mean, it's, and it said Lorraine Prince had a, had a comment, it, it's largely due to the local planning and zoning boards. And that is why a stormwater fee would be a real, a really important incentive to minimize impervious surface. Um, so that just makes the case for it. As far as why, how the DEP steps in, they do have you know limitations on how close you can be to the flood zone and all that, but you can always get waivers. And, and, and this is, it goes back to what Marcus was saying about power. I mean, if you have more power, you're more, more apt to be able to get the permit modification to hire the lawyers and the engineers to, to assist you with that. Um, and the one thing that, that is sort of sort of touched on, but I will let me just real touch on it more more explicitly, is that what we're talking about right now in 2022 is one thing. In 2050, it's a brand new thing with climate change. I mean, along the Delaware River where Camden is, the Delaware River is supposed to rise by 18 inches, a foot and a half by 2050. And the same is true on not, you know, maybe not exactly 18 inches, but you know, similar on the Atlantic Ocean side, you know, of New Jersey. And so the point is, is that. These issues are only going to be exacerbated as river levels rise, as Ben said, as you know, the tides are the high tide will be a higher tide, and so it's just essential that we get it right now um, with respect to controlling impervious surface that exists already, and also by minimizing and limiting it as you move forward. And and I'll, and I'll jump in um, really quickly there when uh, someone in the in the chat spoke about um, legislation. Um, that's the next step. And this is what Andy is speaking about. And we need to be able to um, watch this recording again and, and see what we can take to our, our local municipalities. Um, because cause, cause he's laid out real solutions. Like these are things that could actually work tomorrow if implemented. But the other piece, um, speaking directly to the question is, we have to understand that by the time it gets to the DP level, it's very late in the game. And it can be stopped at the municipal level. Like that's the piece that we often forget. Before it gets to the DEP's radar, it has to go through your municipal government where it goes to your town council. Your town council votes on it. After that, it goes to your planning board and then your planning board votes on it. So these are the local people that we all have direct access to. Everyone has a website. We can get their phone numbers and their emails. We have to do more at the start because then once it, the ball gets rolling, it's very difficult to stop. But it's more, most important for us to be tuned in at our local level 
because everything starts there. And that's where the power is. When we think about we don't have power. We have power with our municipal government. We can stop things in their track. We have to just remind people who, 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 who ensures that they have these cushy jobs that they have and hold them accountable. Like if you know these people are the ones who are making these decisions, stop being so starstruck every time you see someone and want to get a photo, hold them accountable when you see them. Let them know why are you continuously voting for facilities that are polluting our communities? This is your job. We'll do our job. You do your job. We all do our job. We can get progress. That's, that's awesome, Marcus. And I'll just let me just add to that and, and add also add to what Ben said in the chat about sustainability awareness. One thing I think we could do, and maybe some of this group should, our panel should talk about, is trying to, to, to come up with a model sustainability ordinance rather than having 300 communities across the state have to come up with their own or 500, whatever it is. Let's come up with a model one. We, we did one in Camden already with, uh, with the, the help of the, the DEP, Environmental Office of Environmental Justice. And let's get it to every community, at least every EJ community, and, and make it easier for them to pass it. And then the, the community has a much stronger uh, ore in the water, so to speak, much more leverage to stop these things at the point that you're, you and Ben are saying, Marcus. Truly, I don't. Um, oh, sorry, Ben, did you want to just say something really quick? Oh, I was just going to say totally agree with Andy on that. Um, you know, Newark and Camden both passed a similar uh, ordinance, sustainability ordinance, that during a similar period of time. And Newark's actually had a bit more teeth to it than Camden yes. for, yes. for whatever reason. So it just shows the, the importance of, of all being working together, being on the same page and, and you know, yeah, having a model one that that we know works and can be adopted other places. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a, a great conversation and I, I feel like folks don't want it to end. I don't want it to end. Um, it's really been an excellent Q&A, an excellent presentation. Um, I know we're all already at eight, but would love to hear some final thoughts from you all if we could. Uh, Andy, if you would like to start. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, um, many thanks to my co-panelists, Marcus and Ben, who did such a great job. And they're just um, such, I mean, champions for, for doing the right thing. Um, so it's, a, it's an honor to be on the panel with them. And thanks again to the, the co-sponsors, the legal conservation voters and Water Spirit and NAACP and everybody who participated in this. Um, my final thought is, is that I just want to circle back to something that Marcus said about environmental justice and the notion that Every person in this state, in this country, deserves safe drinking water and clean waterways at an affordable rate, no matter where they live or what they look like. And that should be the guiding lens of everything that we do in, in this state, in this country, and with respect to water equity. And the stormwater fee is such an important way to achieve and, and undo an existing inequity in which owners of large swaths of impervious surface are not paying for this combined sewage that they're generating or in separate sewers, the stormwater that they're generating. And it's causing, you know, public, in the case of combined sewage, public health, you know, problems where kids walk through puddles of sewage to get to their bus stop. It's not right. And then ratepayers have to pay to fix it. So I'm really hoping that um, state cities across the state will, especially the CSO communities, will adopt a stormwater fee. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And if, Ben, if you would like to go. Sure, thank you. So thank you to my excellent co-panelists and thank you to all the organizers of this uh, great event and to everyone that signed on. Um, just, just one thought I guess I had is, you know, if you're someone tuning into this, uh, this presentation and you don't live in a community like this and, you, you know, you don't have a combined sewer system, you know, just try and think and have empathy of, you know, your sewage probably probably a good chance that your sewage does go to one of these communities, that your trash goes to one of these communities to be burned, that the goods that you're buying are being shipped here on ports in these communities, which are polluting them, that the, the, the cement that you buy to build a house is in some big, terrible plant that's, that's blowing dust all over Camden, you know, so try and think, you know, beyond your immediate neighborhood and, and realize that every single day, you know, every single time you use the bathroom, you know, every single time you throw something away, you are having an impact on these places, whether you know it or not. So, you know, just because you don't live there, try and be an advocate for these communities that you are impacting, whether you know it or not. Thanks, Ben. And Marcus, if you could round us out. No problem. Thank you. I, I, I echo Ben and Andy's sentiments about thanking everyone involved with 
um, bringing this great webinar to the people. I'm grateful for everyone who's tuned in and for everyone who will get the recording and will uh, become educated from that as well. Um, my parting thought is I'm not anti-business. I'm not anti-development. I think that people should have an opportunity to beautify cities. I think that cities should have new structures. I, I, I believe in development. I believe in labor. I believe in the industry, but also believe that you should do your part to make sure you're mitigating the, the damage that you're causing. If you're building something new, you need to make the proper precautions to ensure that you're not causing a disproportionate um, rate of flooding because of the materials you're bringing in. If you're breaking ground and you're adding these porous materials, you are now contributing to a flooding issue in that area. And we need to make sure that we hold people accountable with, if you're going to build here, you have to make sure that you, your infrastructure is, is going to be conducive to, to not adding to a problem and you're actually helping the community. So I just always wanna make that clear. Like I'm not against buildings coming up. There's many, many, many ways that you can still ensure that you're not causing a, a burden for the community. And I think that I'm, I'm, I'm really trying my best to bring our different communities together because it's too often labor over here, community activists over here, residents over there. We can do them all, but we just have to make sure people are actively working to do it correctly. And guess what? Sometimes that costs money and these cheap, greedy companies don't wanna spend money and that's why we have to put things in legislation. So it's no longer a choice. You have to do it. So that's why we need everybody on here to continue to be active in your communities so that we can push the legislation to force people to do the right thing until it becomes second nature. We're not there yet, but we can get there if everyone continues to do their part. Everyone just has to do their part. So again, thank you to everyone. Much appreciation to all of the uh, organizers. And uh, I know this is a, a series so best of luck with the remaining uh, uh, presentations in the series. And thank you again for having um, myself and my good friends as speakers tonight. Thank you so much to our speakers and to everybody who joined us today. Um, as was mentioned, it's the first of a four-part series. So stay tuned um, and have a lovely night, everyone. <laughs>